The majority of you in the audience are, are clinicians and really you see the pathologist as you know, the bearer of bad news that your patient has died or hopefully your patient hasn't died but a member of the family has and you want to know what the exact cause of death because that's going to guide you in your screening. So getting the pathological diagnosis when there is a sudden death is of tremendous importance. And you may think it's easy because, you know, we're pathologists, we have a body, we can look at the heart. Oh, the answer is going to be pretty obvious. But it's not as obvious as you think. How do I... Oh, yes, here we are. Yeah. And really, I'm talking about it. sport is the issue today. And I, I was asked by uh, the histopathology, which is our major journal, to give a review on sudden death in sports because pathologists suddenly became interested in about two years ago with high profile cardiac arrests on the football field particularly. So I give the title of the fittest person in the morgue, right? Because you don't expect fit people to end up in a morgue, right? And really what's important, you already have known and seen lots of pictures this morning from all the clinicians about it. The incidence, right, is variable. That's number one, depending on the series. But obviously, we see the high profile because they get a huge amount of publicity. Okay? And going on from that, you can see here the most common in elderly, particularly in the older population, is coronary artery disease. But the emphasis in younger people in particular is the cardiomyopathies and channelopathies as well. Right? What cases now when someone dies suddenly? Fit, healthy, presumably asymptomatic in the majority of cases, although that's another issue for your clinicians who are asymptomatic, who are symptomatic, and how do you screen? Well, in this country, all sudden deaths have to have an autopsy. That's an important thing. In other countries, in the Europe, you do not need to have an autopsy. If, um, if someone is prepared to sign it off as natural causes, there was no suspicious circumstances. But in this country, Everybody with a known cause of death, right? Accidental, suspicious, has not been seen or treated by a registered medical practitioner. Interestingly, we also have to autopsy some people in death in custody in prison, as well as with industrial diseases. But the emphasis is obviously the unknown cause of death, the previously well patient who collapses and dies unexpectedly. And really, what's important is that the pathologist works closely together with the coroner and also with the cardiologist, with the family. In other words, as a pathologist, when I'm asked to do an autopsy and investigate a sudden death, I just do not do it in isolation. I will do it. I have to know the circumstances of the death, the background of the individual, the family history. And it's a coroner's officer who will give me all that information. And in addition, in a sudden death, where it's a young person, because the high risk of it being a genetic cause and a cardiological screening of the family, I will need to work closely with the cardiologist who is following up that family when there has been a tragic death in a young person. All right? And there was an audit carried out in the United Kingdom about five years ago of autopsies carried out by pathologists. In one month, they did a series and analyzed them. And I was one of the pathologists who analyzed the reports from the pathologists. And what this showed was, I highlighted here, most commonly, cardiac enlargement, hypertrophy, as the cause of death without appropriate investigations and correlation. In other words, you as a pathologist can give a cause of death as cardiac hypertrophy. Full stop. You don't need to say anything else. You don't need to give a clinical pathological correlation, you need not go into the background of the patient. Simply say it's hypertrophy and the coroner will accept it. But what had happened is the coroner and the pathologist wasn't really investigating. Had the patient hypertension, right? Was there a family history of sudden death to explain the hypertrophy as being perhaps hypertrophic adamopathy? Pathologists weren't simply, they were just stating it was hypertrophy. Another issue is, how do pathologists define hypertrophy? Ye clinicians have difficulty, but pathologists also have diff What's a heavy heart? What's a hypertrophied heart? What's a normal heart in a child compared to a, an athlete, compared to a sedentary person, male, female? The variation is quite difficult. You ask an average pathologist, what's a normal heart weight? And they'll vary in their answers. Okay?
So a matter of training and definitions is very important when we're undertaking autopsies. So this audit showed that we're having problems. Now, you already have been told that coronary artery disease, with lots of excellent talks this morning, particularly in the older athlete, is of tremendous importance. And it's pretty straightforward for pathologists when you've got an autopsy, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarct, or hemorrhagic infarction, ruptured thrombosed atheromatous plaque, very straightforward case, you've got your cause of death. Narrow coronary artery, right, significant narrowing. What? When it's less narrowed and there's no scarring or damage in the heart. Well, what role has a narrow coronary artery when there's no damage in causing a sudden death? And also, we pathologists can overestimate narrowing. We, defend, we look at our eye. We don't do any fancy measurements. We simply judge with a naked eye at autopsy and say, that's significant coronary artery disease. Looks narrow, but then we're dealing with a dead patient. The blood vessel collapses. There is an exaggerated collapse and narrowing of the vessel at autopsy. It's no longer full of blood. And I can do what I call the probe test to pathologists. You have to do the probe test. And you can open up that coronary artery two millimeters, normal blood flow. So that's not a significant lesion. A pathologist may overinterpret this as being the cause of death, missing out on other diagnosis. In addition, age should not be a barrier to labeling someone as ischemic heart disease. Here's a little girl of 11 who collapsed on the school run. She'd been previously utterly asymptomatic. These are her aortic valve leaflets, and that's her ascending aorta full of lipid-rich atheromatous plaques. It looks like the aorta of an 80-year-old. And these were her coronary arteries, completely blocked by lipid. And when I phoned up the mother, when she phoned up, she told me, we have familial hypercholesterolemia. I have it, my father had it, my grandfather yet my daughter was not screened. So the big issue of when do you begin screening for familial hypercholesterolemia, right? But what we're dealing with today are sudden deaths and what are previously young, healthy people, right? Death of young people in sport. And so we're dealing then with the cardiomyopathies and the channelopathies, as already been described by the previous speakers. What I always say to pathologists is you've got to look at the whole heart. Pathologists do routine autopsies. They do many of them routinely throughout the day. They're busy people. But I say you have to look at the whole heart and look at it in great detail, not just look at it and say it's normal. All right? You've got to look carefully at the coronary arteries, which are deep within fat. They're not very obvious. You may think coronary arteries look pretty obvious. Pathologists don't look at the full coronary artery. I get hearts sent to me, query cardiomyopathies, and a lesion is missed in the LAD or in the left main stem because the pathologists simply haven't looked deep in because the coronary arteries are covered by a lot of fat. And fat also in the right ventricle can be overinterpreted by pathologists as a rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy because older patients, particularly obese patients, have a lot of fat in their right ventricle and pathologists may not be aware of that. In addition, they have to do a lot of what we call sampling, taking lots of blood from right and left ventricle throughout the whole circumference, embedded and processed and looked at. Because a heart may look absolutely normal to the naked eye, but histologically you can have sarcoid, myocarditis, as Rory said, fibrosis, and yet the heart can look totally normal to the naked eye. So you have to do histology in a sudden death and lots of blocks of tissue. Now, this is bad news to the coroner. The coroner is a legal person. The pathologist does the autopsy for the coroner. The coroner has to pay for all this processing. And a coroner has a limited budget. And a coroner will object saying, why are you taking all these blocks of tissue? I'll have to pay for all this. A good pathologist will give me a cause of death straight away. Without going through all this hassle of paying for all this, and that's a big issue. Pathologists are forced to give immediately a cause of death, and a bit of coronary artery disease will do. And they avoid doing this sampling. They're actually discouraged, and also we've got the Human Tissue Act, which prevents us pathologists from taking tissue unless we've got consent from the family. That's another issue I won't go into. And also, 
There may be misdiagnosis done by pathologists. Breed is a healthy boy of 11, collapsed and died while running. The cause of death given was acute heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy. That's because the ventricle looked dilated. But when I reviewed the histology, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy can look like dilated macroscopically when you look naked eye. And tragically, this young boy's father had died in 1998 and he'd been labelled as a myocardial infarct. So in other words, we can, even today, we misdiagnose entities and we miss in two generations. All right? So misdiagnosis can occur. And autopsy is inconclusive, even recent cases like the Detroit Marathon. And it's, you think it's pretty straightforward. Here's a hokum. Thick ventricle, myocyte disarray histologically. Here's a dilated left ventricle, thin walled, fibrosis. They're pretty straightforward cases. The average pathologist can diagnose these. Very easy. Here's a dilated right ventricle. Here's arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Fatty infiltration of the right ventricle extending onto the left ventricle. But you can get this with obese patients. You need to do histology to confirm that there is fibrosis and scarring. But what when you have a case like this, a 23-year-old male, fat in his right ventricular outflow tract. This is the pulmonary valve here, fat replacement of the wall, almost transmural, thickening and hypertrophy, what we call fatty hypertrophy of the right ventricle. But look at his coronary artery. One severely narrowed, another totally obliterated. The pathologist would miss this and diagnose coronary artery disease. Yet this young man had cocaine habit. And this was fibrointimal hyperplasia due to cocaine use. So the big issue is dual pathology as well. And can you, fatty infiltration of the right ventricle and fibrosis, can that be seen in ischemic heart disease? Our big issue is when you've got a narrow coronary artery. All right? And here's a hypertrophied left ventricle, thick-walled, greater than 15 millimeters, heavy heart. But look, fat replacement, the right ventricle, extending onto the left ventricle. So left ventricular hypertrophy. But you've got here fat on the right. And this is actually a case of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy with left ventricular hypertrophy. Histology confirmed extensive fibrosis. Here's another case, dilated left ventricle, dilated cardiomyopathy. But it turns out to have a dual mutation in the adhesion molecules. This happened to be arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy with biventricular involvement dominant in the left ventricle imitating dilated cardiomyopathy. So the phenotype can vary, all right? Okay, and here's a case where you see a lot of pathology. There's non-compaction, which is going to be spoken about later. Look, hypertrabeculation in the left ventricle, which is thin-walled. You have got on the right side fatty infiltration, replacement with hypertrabeculation. What have you got here? Non-compaction, dilated cardiomyopathy, ARVC, in other words, we pathologists are given these overlapping phenotypes that look macroscopically quite complex and challenging. And more and more we are looking into the genotype, phenotype variation, the more complexities arise for us as pathologists, and not just for ye clinicians. And a narrow coronary artery by itself. Here's a young boy of 13 who died playing football. A narrow coronary artery, I already showed you an 11-year-old with atheroma, but not all narrow coronary arteries are due to atheroma. You may have unusual entities like intimal and medial fibril muscular dysplasia. And his brother had died of a heart attack, inverted commas, 10 years before. And histology in his brother revealed the same pathology. It's a very rare cause of coronary artery obliteration, fibromuscular dysplasia, which is also genetic. And a thrombose vessel may not just be due to a rupture at the rheumatoid plaque. You will notice here, this is the residual lumen of the coronary artery. And this is intramural hematoma. It's not in the lumen at all. And this is confirmed with histology showing spontaneous dissection of a coronary artery, which is not familial, which is important, seen mainly in young pregnant females, and in males is linked to cocaine drug use in males. <laughs> 
so important that not all thrombosis blocked arteries are due to atheroma. You need histology. And I wish to thank Cry, who has actually enabled me to build up a team because pathologists are very busy people. General pathologists do a lot of other work besides autopsies. So it enables pathologists to send to me hearts from all throughout the country to look at them in detail because they simply haven't the time to look at them. And we can process and look at the hearts for free. This is important. The coroner does not have to pay for it. And over the years, our practice has gone up to over 400 hearts per year. And as a result of that, we have built up a large database of 2,300 cases. It's the largest pathology database in the world of sudden death. And what I will show you is that over half the cases, now these are obviously a select referral group to me, are, are SADs, what we consider sudden death. The heart is morphologically normal. 16% of cardiomyopathies, but look, left ventricular hypertrophy, obesity is coming into it, right? Left ventricular fibrosis, which Rory already referred to. All these are in the cardiomyopathy groups. Then sudden death in epilepsy and congenital, other unusual abnormalities, particularly in younger patients, must be considered. So in the pathology, it's SAD seems to predominate. And the age group is younger age group, both male and female, with male predominance, as we're all quite aware of. And what about the circumstances of death? Well, we found... Most die at home. But here, what you're interested in today is 11% die during exertion. So, in other words, death during sporting activity. Considers a significant group when you come to defibrillators and actually prevention of sudden deaths, which Matt's already talked to you about. And from this cry, we've done many different projects, but an emphasis here today is on, obviously, sudden death in sport. And really... The UK currently lacks a systematic national registry, to my knowledge, and I mean, Sanjay may talk about this. Is there any national registry being planned for sudden death in sport? None that you're aware of. And no details are available from any sporting organisation. So all we're left with is a retrospective study. And I'm sure Sophie in the audience may... This is work that was carried out, and we published two years ago, we gathered together in our database 118 cases of sudden death in young athletes. And really, you can see there, that's what's predominating are the cardiomyopathies, not unexpectedly, but also morphologically normal heart comes number two after the cardiomyopathies. And number three is coronary artery pathology. So looking at the coronary arteries and abnormalities of them are important in the, this is what I tell pathologists, look at the abnormal muscle, look that the heart's normal to eliminate any other pathology, and finally, look carefully at the coronary arteries, not just for atheroma, but in younger patients, abnormal coronary arteries. And other cardiac pathology should not be left out either. Myocarditis, floppy mitral valve, etc. Right. And you will note here, I've highlighted, atherosclerosis is only in the older age group, the ones over 35, right? And the anomalous coronary arteries are in the under 35. So atheroma older, anomalous coronary arteries younger age group. Right, from this, the majority are males. Not surprisingly, we're all familiar with that fact. And the majority of who die are not the elite professional athletes, it's the amateur athletes, 85%. And one of the sports in this country, because it's a UK-based study, football predominates, running second, rugby third, and you'd be glad to hear, I think, sailing, <coughs> cricket, and golf is included. So I don't know whether they are, I wouldn't call them elite sporting activities, would you? <laughs> right? Now, talking about hypertrophy. You're already familiar from Sanjay's work about pathological left ventricular wall thickness and its role in athletes, particularly white versus uh, Afro-Caribbean athletes, and the increased thickness of the wall of the left ventricle. Well, I will tell you, what about pathologists? How do they define hypertrophy? And we don't have, and we don't have a universal criterion as pathologists, and this is what I'm trying to bring about as I teach a lot of pathologists, is an increase in heart weight over 500 grams in the average adult male. 
right? 400 grams in a female, and the wall thickness has to exceed 15 millimeters. 15 millimeters, this is what we expect. Now, ye have a criteria of less in the living patient. But in the dead patient where the heart is fixed, right, in systole or diastole, depending on when they die, this is what we look at. So heart weight greater than 500, thickness increase of 15 millimeters. And if there's myocyte disarray, it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If there isn't, if there's only myocyte hypertrophy only, it's idiopathic hypertrophy, with or without fibrosis, so we can get them. Hocum is I, I only label a patient as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy if I find that there is myocyte disarray microscopically. Otherwise, it's idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy with or without fibrosis. And here's what we mean. Hyper increase 15 millimeters hypertrophy of the wall and of the papillary muscles and trabeculae in the left ventricle. And here is where we've got the hypertrophy, an impact lesion in the outflow tract, myocyte disarray. Pretty straightforward <coughs> hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But what about this case where there's hypertrophy? And look, a lot of fat in the right ventricle. Overlapping with ARVC, where you can get hypertrophy of the left ventricle. I don't know whether it's a compensatory thing, particularly in young people, but I've noticed it pathologically in ARVC. And we've just submitted a paper on that to a European journal. You've got to do histology to confirm ARVC because you've got to have fibrosis as well as fat. Fat alone is not enough. And one thing I get weekly, weekly from other pathologists is this ARVC. No, it's not. It's ordinary fatty infiltration of the right ventricle in an obese individual. So it's a big issue over diagnosis now because it's the latest, hottest diagnosis among pathologists is ARVC. They overdiagnose because they think fat is the same as ARVC, and it's not. So histology is essential. You've got to show collagen up as red here. All right? Here's another hypertrophy heart. Right? And you see the overlap. How do we mean by hypertrophy? How do I know as a pathologist what's hypertrophy and what's physiological? Here's another hypertrophy heart. But guess what? The weight was normal. The weight, I could take the weight of the heart. Taking out blood clots, that's important, I tell pathologists, you cannot have a blood clot adding to the weight. And this is a death in systole. The thickened wall, but the heart weight was normal. So I define that as death in systole. And you may also get hypercontracted myocytes. Do you see? <coughs> Where there's irregular hypercontraction bands here, pink transverse bands. It's just died in systole. But the Ventricle can look very thick walled, and pathologists label that as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or hypertrophy of the left ventricle. Right? And, yes, and this already referred to, right, is about hypertrophy with fibrosis in athletes, already mentioned by her. So I won't go through it, just telling you that myocyte hypertrophy and fibrosis can vary extensively in the left ventricle in both hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and idiopathic hypertrophy of the left hand. Irregular focal scars to widespread diffuse scarring. And here is the histology confirming the type of scarring, both interstitial and replacement. And the other problem is valve disease. With hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in any hypertrophy left hand, you get a bit of bubbling, you get a bit of floppy change in the mitral valve, slight floppy mitral valve. And pathologists may overinterpret that uncertain significance of Michael's work, Michael Papadakis, showing that overinterpretation of my, mixed eye degeneration of the mitral mm -hmm. valve, overinterpretation of atheromatous plaques. What do we mean by focal myocarditis? A little bit of inflammation. There are some lymphocytes in every heart, like there's lymphocytes in your, in your lungs. There's always a few lymphocytes running around your myocardium. Would you be surprised how many pathologists interpret that as myocarditis? And in the general population, these may be erroneously overestimated. And you already saw this about the actual types of uh, channel these may occur. This is what I call floppy chain, very severe changes in the mitral valve. It can be linked to cardiomyopathy to focum. It can also be linked to the DCM. But there also can be no evidence of cardiomyopathy, just the floppy mitral valve alone. And with floppy mitral valve, you may also get dissection of the aorta can be a cause of death. 
in athletes. And as you know, Michael Phelps is very tall and thin and has hypermobile joints. Is he marathons? He even said in his autobiography that he suffered from cardiac palpitations and went for screening for marathons, but he never said whether he was positive or negative. So, right. <coughs> so going back to these, the morphologically normal heart. Here's a normal heart, less than 15 millimeters, weight less than 500 grams. But I say to pathologists, remember hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, particularly the troponin T, the heart may normal. <coughs> Myocarditis sarcoidosis may be macroscopically normal, you need histology. Also fibrosis and ARVC can look normal. So I won't go into these, I think I'll stop there because we're at one o'clock. Just to say that relying on a good pathology report with both the macroscopic description of the heart when you have a sudden death and there's no other cause, and histology is essential to come to a proper diagnosis to help you cardiologists with screening of the family. Thank you.